Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the very best NCLEX review in the world, in my opinion. Uh, you can go to clinicreviews.com to find out more about our online on-demand review. I highly recommend it. It's really phenomenal. Mark Klimek is a phenomenal teacher and uh, developer of that review. Thank you to all of our channel members. I really appreciate uh, your membership. I really do. It means a lot to me. And if you're interested in paying me for something, uh, because the YouTube channel in general is free. Uh, if you're interested in paying me for something, you can do small group tutoring with me. I do next gen tutoring. Mark Klimek does small group tutoring as well. His is not next gen, but it is NCLEX prep. You can go to clinicreviews.com and sign up for one of my next gen small group tutorings. So today we're going to be talking about afterload and preload. They sound really similar, but the interesting thing about these two things is they're really very conceptual. So these are concepts that help us understand what's going on in the heart and in the body, but we don't measure preload or afterload. There's never any, there's never anywhere in the chart where you measure preload and document it, or you measure afterload and you document it. Okay. They're, they're just concepts that we use these words and we go, okay, I know what you're talking about if you say preload. I know what you're talking about if you say afterload. And, and so they're concepts and they're things that we use in, a, in an academic setting more often than a clinical setting. And so this really is not something that you probably need to watch if all you're doing is preparing for NCLEX. I mean, if you're like, I really want to know about preload and afterload, then watch it. But it's not really so much of an NCLEX concept as it is an academic concept that we use to help you better understand function of the heart and why cardiac output is what it is. So let's go ahead and get started. So preload, preload is actually a volume. It's end diastolic volume. It's the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole. If you don't know what diastole is, it's when the heart is at rest. So the heart contracts and then it's at rest. And then it contracts and then it's at rest and then it contracts and then it's at rest and it fills when it's at rest. That's when it fills. And, um, and so preload is how much volume is in the ventricle at the end of diastole after it's done filling. Now we also have this concept of diastolic pressure, which is not the same as preload. The diastolic pressure is the pressure in the artery when the heart is at rest. So diastolic pressure is the pressure in the aorta and the brachial artery and the popliteal artery. It's the amount of pressure that's exerted against the inside of the vessel wall while the heart is at rest. And of course, that pressure goes up when the heart contracts, and that's called systolic pressure. But I just wanted you to understand there's a difference between diastole and diastolic pressure. And then there's preload which is the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole. Now, afterload, interestingly enough, is not a, is not a volume, it's a pressure, <laughs> okay? So it's the pressure the left ventricle has to overcome in order to eject blood. Now, systole, the word systole, is the word we use to indicate the heart is contracting. So you have diastole rest, systole contraction, diastole rest, systole contraction, diastole rest, systole contraction. So systole is when the heart is contracting, but that systolic pressure is the pressure inside the arterial wall against the inside of the arterial wall when the heart is contracting. So the pressure goes up during contraction and it goes down during rest. It goes up during contraction and goes down during rest. Afterload is the amount of pressure the heart has to overcome to get that blood out. So remember that blood flows from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So the heart has to generate a high enough pressure to overcome that peripheral pressure so that it can actually eject the blood. So preload is the volume of blood. It's the available blood to be ejected. Afterload is the amount of pressure the heart has to overcome to eject the blood that's available in the heart to be ejected. I am not good at drawing pictures. So instead of drawing a heart, I just drew boxes and we have the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle, the four chambers of the heart. So the right ventricle can have an end diastolic volume. That's preload. The left ventricle can have an end diastolic volume. That's preload. So the amount of volume in there at the end of diastole. 
Now, preload, if you look over there on the left, it says preload is affected by venous return. So how much is actually returned to the heart and overall blood volume? I mean, you could have great venous return, but if your overall blood volume is low, then you're going to have lower preload. And you could have really good blood volume, but if your venous return is low, then you're going to have low preload, right? So those two things are the main things that affect preload. Now, afterload is the pressure, the left ventricle, okay, the left ventricle has to overcome to eject blood. Now, it could be a pulmonary artery pressure as well, but primarily we look at peripheral pressures. After a lot of times we look at the peripheral pressure and it's affected by diameter of the vessel. So if, it, if the diameter gets smaller, if it constricts, afterload goes up, pressure goes up, afterload goes up. If, if the vessel remains the same diameter, but you just put more volume in there, the pressure also goes up because that just increases the pressure against the inside of that vessel wall. So it's also affected. So blood volume affects both preload and afterload. Okay, so if, if they're hemorrhaging out, you should say preload's going down and afterload's going down. If they're dehydrated, you should say preload's going down and afterload's going down. If their fluid volume overloaded, it's just going to depend because if it's just backing up, maybe all the blood, their fluid volume overload, but it's all backing up into their lungs and into their jugular vein and into the venous side. Well, then preload's going to go up, but afterload may not. It just depends, right? If it's backing up or not. So these are concepts and we just talk about them as concepts to help us understand. There is never a time when you're going to be talking with another nurse in the hospital and you're going to be talking about preload or afterload with that nurse. It's never going to happen. These are, these are terms that we use to help us just understand conceptually uh, volume and uh, venous return and pressure in the arteries. Okay. Now, Let's talk about preload. What can increase venous return? Because venous return and blood volume are the two things that affect preload. So what can increase venous return? Primarily the muscle pump increases venous return. So um, if you are, when you get up and walk and the muscles are contracting against the veins, y'all, that increases venous return. So the muscle pump has a huge effect. That's why when people are on bed rest, preload goes down. That's why we say get people out of bed, get them walking, do range of motion, active or even passive range of motion activities. That helps increase preload, which helps increase, you know, the volume. And then you can get more volume out because your cardiac output goes up and all that. Right. And then obviously increase volume. How can we increase volume? Give fluid, give them bolus, a thousand mil bolus of normal saline. Um, can you give them blood? You can give them blood. That's not usually how we increase volume. We usually increase volume by giving uh, crystalloids. Crystalloids are things that are crystal clear. If it's crystal clear. It's a crystalloid like saline, lactated ringers. So we usually use crystalloids to um, increase volume. And then what can decrease venous return? Inactivity. So your patients who are on bed rest have decreased preload. Uh, decrease volume if they're dehydrated, if they're hemorrhaging, um, if you're diuresing them with a, a lot of diuretics that can decrease preload or venous dilation. Now that doesn't happen very often where we just ven venous dilate. However, the one drug that we give that causes pretty significant venous dilation is nitroglycerin, like nitro, nitroglycerin sublingually or nitroprusside. Anything that starts with nitro causes venous dilation, which decreases preload, which decreases and diastolic volume, you, has, you have less volume to be ejected and it decreases cardiac output, okay? So it does do that, which decreases the work of the heart, which decreases oxygen demand, which decreases angina. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into all that, okay? Um, I think you can watch my acute coronary syndrome. I have a, an entire video on that acute coronary syndrome. You can watch that one. I'm not gonna talk about it here. All right, so that decreases venous return. Now, what can increase overall blood volume, a fluid bolus uh, or pregnancy? Pregnancy is another example where fluid blood volume is increased, not intentional, like we didn't do anything about it, but pregnancy increases overall fluid volume quite a bit. So you have increased preload for sure during pregnancy. What can decrease blood volume, diuretics, dehydration, or hemorrhage? All right, let's talk about afterload. So afterload is all about constriction and dilation and volume. Okay. Afterload is affected by, by the diameter of the vessel 
and by volume, but I already talked about blood volume. So what can increase or decrease blood volume? You could just take those and put them over on the afterload side. And those also are going to affect afterload the same way as they affect preload. I'm just not going to go over them again. So let's talk about the dilation or constriction. So what can cause vasoconstriction? So vasoconstriction is a smaller vessel. It increases afterload. Vasoconstriction increases afterload. So primarily the sympathetic nervous system causes vasoconstriction. Or we can give sympathomimetics, drugs that mimic the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system, some of the neurotransmitters are epinephrine, norepinephrine. Uh, dopamine is actually a sympatho, sy sympathetic uh, neurotransmitter. So these are all called sympathomimetics. So you can give vasopressors like dopamine, dobutamine. You can give norepinephrine, levofed. We put uh, people who have very low blood pressure, um, like shock. We can give them, uh, put them on a, on a, a levo drip in the ICU. It's good. They're going to be in the ICU with that or epinephrine. Okay, that causes vasoconstriction. So sometimes we want, we vasoconstrict just because the blood pressure is so low. And sometimes we vasoconstrict because they're massively vasodilated. For example, anaphylactic shock, anaphylactic shock, an allergic reaction, like a bee sting. Let's say you're allergic to peanuts or a bee sting or bees, and it causes massive vasodilation. You go to anaphylactic shock. We give you a shot of epinephrine because that causes vasoconstriction. It's a sympathomimetic. And then what can cause vasodilation? Well, antihypertensives, the classic stuff. Antihypertensive, we give direct vasodilators, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs. Um, I have a, a whole video on blood pressure meds. You can watch that. Um, or um, inflammatory cytokines can also be released with um, inflammation, which is present in infection. So you get these inflammatory cytokines released during in sepsis or anaphylaxis. And so when you have these inflammatory cytokines released, they cause massive vasodilation, right? So they dilate. So that means you've got to give a sympathomimetic like epinephrine to cause vasoconstriction. So as nurses, primarily we affect constriction or dilation by giving meds. There's not a whole lot, unless, unless we can get them to stimulate their sympathetic nervous, nervous system naturally. How do you stimulate your sympathetic nervous system naturally without drugs? Go for a walk, watch a scary movie, get into a fight with your boyfriend. I don't know. Like, how do you get, how do you stimulate your sympathetic nervous system, right? So in summary, preload and afterload both affect cardiac output. I would say, if I had to say which affects cardiac output more, I would say preload affects cardiac output more than afterload does because preload determines the volume that's in there and you can't put more volume out than what you have in there. So it's a major factor, major factor in cardiac output. Preload and afterload are both affected by blood volume. Preload and afterload are both affected by medications. Uh, for example, uh, preload is affected by diuretics. Afterload is affected by sympathomimetics like levofed epinephrine. It's also affected by antihypertensives like direct vasodilators, ARBs, ACE inhibitors, preload, and pre preload is greatly affected by the muscle pump. So are there any non-pharmacological actions that we can take to affect this? So preload, yes, there are some things we can do. We can in increase preload through exercise, SCDs, compression stockings, which is why we do them, y'all. Yes, it also prevents DVT. But historically, back in the day before we, you know, when I started as a nurse, we never talked about DVTs when I started out as a nurse. Like seriously, we didn't. 30 years ago, we weren't worrying about DVT prevention. That's a new thing we started doing. But we still did SCDs and TED hose. Why? To increase preload for people who are on bed rest. Um, and we can decrease preload by rest or fluid restrictions. So these are some non-pharmacological. Afterload, it's not that easy actually to increase afterload or decrease afterload uh, non-pharmacologically. However, exercise can increase afterload. And then nicotine and caffeine both increase afterload. So if you want to decrease afterload and you don't have any meds available, ask them, are you drinking a lot of caffeine? Cut it out. We can decrease afterload. Are you smoking? Cut it out. We can decrease afterload. Um, or you can rest to decrease afterload. 
Which statement best reflects correct client education for a client with a blood pressure of 136 over 86? Now, it doesn't say anything about preload or afterload here. You're not going to get an NCLEX question that asks about preload or afterload. Okay. It's not going to happen. But when you look at this and I see a blood pressure, I go, well, that's sort of afterload, right? Because afterload and blood pressure are conceptually the same thing. It's the pressure in the aorta, in the artery. All right. So this blood pressure is good because it's a normal reading. Maybe this, uh, the blood pressure, this blood pressure indicates the client has hypertension or high blood pressure. I know that's not right. It has to be greater than 140 over 90 to be hypertension. So I'm crossing off B. The blood pressure increases the workload of the heart. The client must consider modifying his or her lifestyle. Maybe. D, the blood pressure seems a little low. The client must be further assessed for orthostatic hypotension. Well, I know that's not right. So I know that B and D are not right. So it's either A or C. Now, 20 years ago, the answer would have been A, but it's not A anymore. They've changed it. And I don't find that a lot of nurses understand this. This is actually considered pre-hypertension. The correct answer is the blood pressure increases the workload of the heart. How? Increased afterload, y'all. Increased afterload. Uh, the client must consider modifying his or her lifestyle. So it's not high enough for to do medications. Pre-hypertension does not require meds. Pre-hypertension requires lifestyle modification. So I know this is sort of small. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger for you. I don't know if I can. Normal now is considered less than 120 over 80. Did you know that? Did you know that? Uh, Pre-hypertension is 120 to 139. That's It keeps getting lower every day. I swear to you, it gets lower. Pre-hypertension gets lower and lower every time I look. And diastolic between 80 and 89. High blood pressure stage one is 140 to 159. 90 to 99. Stage two is 160 or higher or 100 or higher. And a hypertensive crisis is higher than 180 or higher than 110. That's sort of hard to read there. Higher than 180 or higher than 110. Okay. So I hope, um, hope that was helpful. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye.